wasn't sure what the composition of the, this room was going to be. So uh, a lot of you guys already know what TDN is. Um, if you've done the whole thing, you've got a lot of newcomers in here. So I'm going to fly through some of this. Um, so if you want me to slow down and explain in detail any of these uh, like CDN 101 topics, feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask detailed questions. Some of them are, are kind of supposed to be high level, but you know I know a lot of people in here have a lot of experience with CDN. Um, so anyway, my name is Jeff Hillslow. Um, I'm here to talk about caching objects at scale. Um, I have been with Comcast for 11 years, come October, which feels like an eternity. And before that, I have past careers. So I'm way older than I want to admit. Um, I basically was one of the, the first couple of people to join a CDN team at Comcast. Um, we called it the IP CDN back then because uh, there was a couple, there were two CDNs and this was a CDN that was going to do uh, basically empowering power transition to IP. So um, back then it was a closed source project. Um, we worked on it for a while and uh, the leader of the project at the time was a guy named Dorn. And he led the effort to, to get the approval to open source the project that we're all here to talk about today uh, and yesterday. And I was part of that effort. Um, and now I do uh, architecture and one of the or the lead architecture that's now in CDN. And uh, in the PMC of this project, and I'm a hardcore motorcyclist. So if you want to talk about that or the project, I'm more than willing to do that. So yeah, make sure I'm getting water on my laptop. Um, so we're going to be talking about CDN 101 stuff. Again, you know, if I need to slow down, tell me. Uh, it's just going to be kind of a quick overview of the CDN, um, what ATC is, how ATS fits into that, um, and kind of how we do caching uh, a little bit. And then that's going to, we're going to get more detail when we go to caching at scale, and then we're going to talk about some of the things that we've learned at Comcast after doing this for, I've been doing it for six years now, so we've accomplished quite a few things in the process. So. Uh, at, at the end of the day, the, the CDN is supposed to deliver bits as quickly as possible to uh, customers, and we do this by ensuring that, that most of the time it's the ideal cache, and the ideal cache typically means that it's a cache that's close to the customer. Um, as we saw in Jamie's talk yesterday, there are a number of ways to route traffic on the CDN. Uh, traffic control uses DNS and HTTP, which I'll go into in detail in a minute. Um, and we will be working on further implementations uh, with it as does, as we saw in uh, Jamie's talk. Uh, so um, I'm going to be using some lingo here, edge cache, mid cache, um, things like that. Uh, at the end of the day, cache is just a, a simple web server where it can or cannot, it uh, depends on the configuration, cache things for you. But the point is to get that server as close as possible to the customer to improve the customer experience and uh, uh, offload a lot of the uh, traffic So um, the characteristics around this that's important for uh, what we do is the semantics around cache hits, cache misses, um, and the process that's you know, cache filling, which is the process of filling a cache after a miss. And uh, in our world, we kind of have, uh, it's not a super rigid hierarchy, but it is kind of uh, rigid. Um, so an upstream host could be either another cache, it could be what we call an origin, and either way, eventually it has to make its way upstream to the origin, which is the source of truth or the original server that the CDN talks to. Now, you, that in and of itself could be a whole different system with a bunch of hierarchical you know, stuff behind it. It could even be another CDN. So, um, ATS, ATC, traffic server is a cache that we've basically specialized around in uh, traffic control. We have our own uh, RAM only cache that is transient things. I'm not going to be talking about that today because we predominantly use uh, ATS at Comcast. Uh, in terms of ATC, we have a routing component, we have a health component, uh, config management, and uh, data and analytics stuff. And basically when you put all of this stuff together, then you get a CDN. And, and the Pi is kind of a logical representation of the generic things that you need to operate a CDN. And in our world, health protocol is traffic monitor, Management is traffic ops and the, the, the API that goes mm -hmm. along with it. Analytics would be travel stats with influx and uh, sorry, I need to switch this with the uh, Nope, can't do that. All right, whatever. <laughs> You're going to keep me off sometime. I have no idea what I'm doing here. All right. 
So the health protocol, this is kind of the, one of the key factors on an ATC-CDN that's maybe different from other ways of doing CDN. So we have um, a, an optimistic health protocol, and that is um, maintained by traffic monitoring. Traffic monitor is an active monitoring component, and it will basically reach out and pull all of the caches on the CDN that are sent to be reported or added down, and those are what we know Set to online, it will just assume that it's on, uh, up, and the status of availability will also be true. Um, so that's why we've got these different um, server status types because sometimes you might want to actually just not monitor it and assume that we have some actual, some use cases that need to actually. Um, all of the thresholds are configurable. Um, we currently use uh, NIC throughput, uh, load average, and uh, those things. Those are our um, in what we call system poll or the health poll, depends on who you talk to, and then we've got the stats poll or the application data, and that's from uh, remap stats, essentially is what that comes from. And we pull that through a, a little JSON API um, called ASAP. So we have this configured to go every two seconds, so each one of our traffic monitors every two seconds monitors the whole CDN. And every six seconds, it hits all the statistics, statistics sorry, um, around uh, delivery service throughput, error rates, things like that. And then it gets picked up by traffic stats and shoved into influx, but that's not what this talk is about. Um, if you look at the logic in the bottom right here, um, it may not be 100% accurate, but basically that's supposed to kind of convey the, the logic behind the optimistic health protocol, which means that um, for all monitors, if there exists a cache where um, it's not healthy, and uh, then it's not available. Um, so, um, oh, I'm sorry, if it's, if it's unavailable, there's a, there exists a cache that is offline on all monitors. I need to read it from the right to the left in my brain. <laughs> then it's not available. I had an alternate way of doing this with logic. It made more sense in my head, but didn't work out as great on the, uh, on the deck. <laughs> uh, so anyway, traffic router uses this to make its decisions. And so traffic, mo traffic router is talking to traffic monitor on the one second interval, except it's now switching between all of the, the traffic monitors that are available. But it does that every one second. So uh, it gets the optimistic aggregated view, which is essentially uh, what all of the traffic monitors are doing. So it doesn't really matter which traffic monitor or traffic router talks to, the answers will be the same. So get the cache detected to be offline or, or unhealthy, whatever, or a delivery service goes over a threshold, then it gets uh, delivery services offline or the cache is offline and it gets removed from uh, consideration. So on the uh, ATC CDN, we have a traffic routing component, and it's written in Java, runs in Tomcat, gives in Tomcat native and OpenSSL, and it is a web server and a DNS server. Uh, once upon a time, a very long time ago, it used to be split into two, two components, and then a long time ago, we decided to combine it for some reason. And uh, so essentially, it's the authoritative DNS server for the entire CDN, so you configure a top-level domain, and Traffic Router gets this through a DNS notification, and Traffic Router automatically generates all of the DNS records based on the configuration that is inside of Traffic Ops. Um, so it supports a, a few features. You know, I think most of us are familiar with these things. Uh, the big thing is the dynamic responses. Uh, so we do dynamic dynamic responses for edge records, and then most everything else is a static DNS record. And so when a what I mean by dynamic response is we, um, when a request comes in for the routing name, which is the, the term that we use for the edge record, uh, then Traffic Router looks at the state information that it has uh, for, that it's pulled from Traffic Monitor. And based on that, that it will generate the RR set. So it may be different depending on what's going on in the CDN. Um, and it does this all the time. Now there is a little cache inside of Traffic Router to slow that for that down, so if it happens that we've already computed that DNS answer, we just pull it out of the cache. Um, EDNS0 client subnet extensions, we need to talk about this towards the end. Um, it's important for localization, but it's currently not really great how it's implemented, so we can work on it a little bit. Uh, 
Um, so localization is a process by which you take an IP address of a client, no matter what, whether it's a resolver or an, uh, an individual you know, laptop or phone or whatever, and you try to associate it with a location. We do that using a deep cover zone, which is uh, uh, more the most specific mapping between um, you know, IP ranges and servers. And then beyond that, we have a cover zone file, which is a, a cache group to IP range association. And then we also have geolocation providers, which we at Comcast and we use Nextline currently, um, but we do support others. And also anonymous proxy blocking, um, which by the way, the anonymous proxy blocking traffic router, we also need to start enforcing that down uh, in ATS as well. So um, the difference between HTTP and DNS delivery services, so I mentioned we do dynamic DNS edge records, and now that's one delivery service type, now we've got this other delivery service type called an HTTP delivery service. And I'll go into some you know, diagrams in a bit, but essentially uh, what this is for is for highly targeted caching. So the difference is with the prior uh, slide, this slide, with DNS, um, typically that is a resolver performing a resolution request on behalf of the client. So the IP address that you see is almost always the, well, yeah, almost always the resolver, caching resolver IP for whatever infrastructure that client's behind. So like Comcast residential DNS service or whatever, those IPs. Um, unless you have this enabled, the DNS or client server extension. So, you know, you get one IP address that may be responsible for 50, 100,000 devices, customers, whatever. It's not very granular. So this actually solves that problem because you have the DNS looked up, but the result of that is your traffic router. So then the request goes to your traffic router, and now your traffic router sees the IP address of the client, and it also knows what URL you want, or the path that you want. So then we take that path, and we consistent hash it, and pick the very specific cache that's supposed to host that content. Um, we have a couple of different um, format options in terms of uh, single response, multi-response, JSON response, and no JSON response. Uh, and uh, we, of course, support TLS and SNI because you have to do that these days on the interwebs. And, uh, oh, also bypass destination. So if through the health protocol and all of that, um, and we can also do this on DNS too, but it's a little bit trickier, um, you can basically direct somebody to some other URL if you want to. Or the conditions are necessary for that response to not be available to that client. Um, and then, of course, we have APIs and metrics um, available through an HTTP interface. Um, all right, so this is kind of the concept that's key to the CDN that a lot of people don't understand too well because it's complicated. <laughs> and uh, and I had a bullet in here that I removed, but I needed to put it back in after talking to uh, Alan. Um, but essentially, cache efficiency um, is enabled through consistent hashing. It was invented by the guys that founded Akamai, and it's used throughout traffic route and ETS. Um, and essentially, if you know, if you take a data structures class and you think about a hash table, um, if you want to change the, the size of this hash table, you have to rehash everything, and it's a really expensive operation. And consistent hashing basically makes it so you don't have to do that. So. This is kind of a, a simple example for how consistent hashing works. Obviously, it's not like 100% bulletproof example, but it's supposed to be a general example of what happens. So um, at a high level, what happens is we have a request that comes in. It doesn't really matter if it's DNS or HTTP, but we can talk about HTTP because it's a good example. So we consistent hash on the path, and what that means is we have a function, like a mathematical function that we run this string through, and it computes a value on the output of that. Now, prior to doing any of this, we constructed using that same exact hash function what's known as this hash ring right here. Um, and so you take that same exact hash function and then you take your set of caches and you, for each one of those caches, there are a certain number of what we call replicas. Um, you may see this as a waiting setting in ATS or ATC um, for different things like parent selection, weights on the objects themselves, that ultimately goes into the hash ring to determine how many entries that one object gets on this hash ring. So in this example, we have four nodes, and each one of these nodes has been run through that hash function a number of times, and then you can see it has a replica here, and, and really it's just the shape, and then the number is the output of that function. 
So you pre-compute all of that stuff. Um, and we re-compute these things whenever we push new configs out. Uh, so you have the hash ring, a request comes in, you consistent hash, and it's gonna land somewhere on that hash ring, that output value. Now that output value isn't going to map directly to anything on here. It might, it's a chance, but likely it won't. So in the case of uh, node D here, if you're requesting HBO, this fancy pointer here, um, and it results in two, then it's gonna forward um, hash is what we call that, to node three. And same goes down here, if you wanna watch uh, Cinemax and it hashes to value 11, then it goes to node three. And you can see that for a number of URLs there. So what happens when you lose node D? This is really the important thing about the properties of consistent hash that really may you magic. So node D goes down, and basically you have HBO that flips over to node B, and you have Cinemax that flips over to node A. Other than that, everything remains as it is. So if you were to have um, a, a parent event with ATS where a parent's marked in on or whatever, um, it's only going to affect any request that went to that host, and all of the requests that went to that host would be evenly, through chance, basically distributed or hand waiting um, across the rest of the nodes that are available. Um, so I can go back and go forward, and you can see how none of uh, these things, so Showtime, Stars, they were not affected. So this is really the bread and butter right here of how CDNs work. Um, and after talking to AMC, this is actually uh, part of how uh, actual where ATS figures out where to store the object on disk, it runs through the same algorithm. Now it's a it's a different kind of implementation, obviously, because it's tied up in the storage, but the concepts are very similar. Um, and they do that obviously. So if you lose one disk drive, you don't invalidate your internet cache. All right. So caching at scale. My icons are super cute. I want you to be acknowledged. <laughs> All right. So basically, at Compass, we we host a really big multi tenant CDN. Uh, multi terabit CDN, and uh, so we have anything from poster art to firmware to uh, um, obviously video on demand, live video, um, emergency alerts, things like that. And so, based on what that object type is and based on how that object is going to be used, it will kind of dictate how you configure your CDN because it's not a one size fits all solution. Sometimes you need DNS delivery service and you're going to sacrifice your cache because you don't care. And other times, if you did that, you would obliterate your entire caching uh, structure at the edge and you'd be screwed. So, and then when you do that, you then start to affect all of the other tenants that are on the cache. So you have to be very careful when you're designing your delivery services for that reason. Um, and so it, it really depends on uh, certain factors, the efficiency it depends on how detailed you are when you're analyzing the problem. And so you can get into trouble with things uh, like uh, bad cache configs and query parameter handling. Um, we've discovered that a lot recently where uh, we've had, a, we recently had a key delivery service where we had a unique device ID in the query parameters and we were using query parameters in the cache key and we were passing them up. So that means that we were causing cache misses for every single request at the edge and then they went upstream as well. Um, so that's terrible, so you need to avoid that. And the, <laughs> the popularity and the long tail of that content also has a determining factor on your cache efficiency as well. And some of that is all tied up in the, the cyclone buffer inside of ATS and how that works because it's just like this right cursor that continually goes through. Um, and, and it's a little bit different than you might be accustomed to with an LRU or other types of caching. Um, but when you're running a multi-tenant system, it works out very well. Um, basic caching hierarchy looks something like this. And the type of delivery service, at least for now, matters, which is kind of unfortunate. So what I mean by that is we have HTTP, we have DNS. These are distinct types of delivery services. Now, we have this thing called a types table. And in the types table, there are a number of these different service types. So we have national service types, and we've got uh, no-cache service types. And so it might be like DNS live national. And so DNS means DNS routed. Live means it goes to RAM cache. National means it uses the, uses the meter. Obviously, that tying it that way to, to like your topology to a drop down means essentially it's not the way to go. 
to any work on that, but that is kind of how it works today. So that will determine whether or not you use this or you go straight from here to here. And each, each this is just a logical template. So each one of these containers has a number of caches in it as well. And in the no cache case, uh, by the way, we do carry some content that we're legally not allowed to cache. So we end up just being like a, like for lack of a better uh, way of putting it, it, we're like an MTU converter because we can do better throughput inside of our network than applies there. So the timeout pyramid, this is something that um, we learned kind of over some experience with some, some finicky clients and um, finicky origins. And so <laughs> the problem is, if you don't look at all of your settings, you consider your client settings and your origin settings and all of the settings between, and they're out of alignment and they're not shaped like a pyramid, you can have weird things like the mid-tier makes a request to the origin. Mid-tier set the timeout after two seconds and it has a retry in there. So that means after four seconds, you fail. Well, the origin has a one minute timeout. So you make a request, you abandon that request, and the origin is too stupid to know that, and it goes and ties up resources for another, what, 56 seconds. Obviously, that's terrible. We've had that happen, actually, more than we would expect. So because of that, we're keenly aware of this. But also on the client side, the client can do that to us at the edge if we're not careful too. And that can lead to requests that go up to the mid, that go up to the origin, and all of that. But the whole point is tune everything, be predictable about what you're doing, be methodical about what you're doing. And yeah, the, the sum of the, the really big thing is the, the timeout plus or times the number of retries. And that's really going to dictate your timing needs going up the hierarchy. Cache storage. Uh, this is a logical diagram of a mythical server that contains a bunch of large drives. That's the disk volumes that are kind of stacked up. And then we've got RAM volumes that go horizontally across the top that are smaller. And then we've got RAM cache. And so basically what I, what I talked about with the, the myriad of different uh, content types that we store, or object types that we store, that will have a bearing as to where the, that gets stored. If it gets stored here, or if it gets stored up here. And so we're a cable company and we're interested in IP video and things like that. So um, we have a need to use this RAM volume uh, for things like linear video content. Uh, we cannot write that to disk and feel good about it because this library is infinite and it's always changing. So if we did that, we would just obliterate the, the disk storage and we would um, ruin the, the experience potentially of things like video on demand where there's a very finite limit to that library. And that's the sort of stuff you want to store on your disk volume. Uh, and then with a RAM cache, that sits on top of, of the, uh, the volumes and it acts as like an accelerator. Uh, there's different algorithms you can use in the RAM cache. We use LRU, uh, but essentially uh, ATS is now, gosh, maybe what, 30 years old? Something like that, 25? <laughs> so, it's getting there, and uh, back then, you know, you, the disk drive technology was not what it is today, and so the RAM cache was way more critical then, but it's still critical for things like our mid-tier caches that have, you know, 60, 70 drives, something like that, spinning drives. Um, so the bigger your RAM cache is, the more efficient your spinning drives can be because it acts as the buffer, of course, from all of your IOPS. Uh, and then solid state storage is now becoming a real viable um, SSD technology, the right endurance has not been too great, but we learned what we need. And the cost of the technology per gigabyte is now starting to come down into the territory of being feasible. And when you're using a VME, the performance is actually so great that you can start to question how much you want in your RAM cache because the, the reads are so fast off the VMEs. What, what is this? It's a different storage medium. Different, uh, like Samsung, Micron, and Intel make the disk drives right now. There's probably other ones, but those are the ones you're going to hear. What is, um, what is the price? Yes, how, how much uh, is RAM? What's the delta between spinning and, and VMA? Yeah, one megabyte is spinning compared to one megabyte. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, number one. Number two, if I did, I probably could share them because we have some you know, bigger. Tell you that that used to be a very big delta, yeah, 
then it's now getting to the point where we can justify those purchases and not feel bad about it because also what we purchase today has to have a service lifetime of five years so um, or so so um, basically if you purchase it today maybe it's a little bit expensive but next year it's going to be even closer and year after that it's going to be real close and then by year four it's going to be stupid if you're running an extended drive today so you can get eight terabyte drives and it's affordable eight terabytes enterprise grade eight terabytes yeah and there's also um, this other newer technology that Intel's coming out with called the Ruler and it's a really weird shape I forget it's like Yuzu or something like that it's and it looks literally like a rough uh, ruler it's like this if you look at it in the front and then it extends through the back and it holds like 32 terabytes 64 terabytes and that is really where we're going to be talking about some crazy stuff because of the density you can get on a single server and ultimately the cache efficiency here is a function of the amount of storage you have and how efficiently you're using the storage is a function of how much requests go upstream. So if you're doing poorly here, you're going to obliterate everything north of you and cause problems. So DNS delivery services, at a high level, this is kind of what we need to do. We need to, uh, when we receive a request from a resolver, we need to locate the, the zone, the DNS zone. We need to find out if, it's, if we have static records for that request. And if we don't, we need to match the delivery service and local X client, select healthy hashes, again that's the health protocol, consistent hash on FPDN, like I said we use consistent hash everywhere, so for that host name that comes in, I perform consistent hash on that, so the RR set that you get back is consistently the same hosts, otherwise we would end up giving you an RR set that has some random servers from a much larger uh, set of servers, um, so that way we can try to get some notion of cache efficiency out of this without just blasting the whole cache group. Do you always restrict that to a UDP packet size, or do you rotate it all inside that? Um, no, we don't. It's a hard limited by number, so we set it to n equals whatever. So like eight, you say, well, we're only going to serve eight. Yeah, now if one of the eight becomes unhealthy, he gets withdrawn, and a new RR set of size eight gets generated. As long as there are eight servers in that cache group that are so, healthy. And so you're going to consistently serve those same eight until something... Until it becomes wrong. unhealthy, correct. All right. Now, if, if there's less, what you end up with, you can end up with that RR set size becoming smaller well, and smaller and smaller, and that's well, kind of going into some yeah, of the any kind of stuff. We've had some issues where other servers, um, DNS servers, will have a larger universe and serve a random subset of the eight yeah. out of that, and that's yeah, yeah. seriously annoying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, we've had, had problems with that. We've also had problems with clients that are bad with large RR, RR set sizes and clients that can only do UDP, clients that can only deal with 500 things like that. So um, this was one way for us to bring consistency into the CDN and also control the, the size of the answer. Yeah? Uh, in, in this context, uh, do we have, I, I don't uh, know, uh, do we have to control the list of uh, the priorities of the list of priorities? It's completely uncontrollable today. Yeah. It's, but I mean, if you're managing a herd of servers, do you care? I don't yeah, care. I have seen that in the service service that the DNS delivery service that I want to be Yeah, you can't do that today. Um, what you could do to get some notion of that is to control the weighting of the server. So if, if the servers had different characteristics, I mean, think of that. We're the if we're working in a multi-tenant world, you know, we're not treating the servers as like special. We don't say you're just on these guys and then maybe these guys, whatever. You're just like, you can go on whichever ones and then we pay attention to the resources mm -hmm. on the servers. If we run out of resources, then we stop serving. Um, I mean, that's generally how the whole CDN works. So I don't know that we would want to move away from that unless we had a good reason. Um, maybe we do, but I think you could you could control a lot of that same behavior by adding more replicas on, on consistent hashing, for example, or less and doing that by we have the ability to do that today yes for any cache you can go change the hash count on that and that controls the, the number of entries on the traffic around your hash rate for for generating that RR set. so anyway when we're done with that we fill the dynamic zone we put it in our cache and then we serve the response uh, so the big thing is with dns delivery services these are usually small objects, small library sizes, things that you don't really care about booting or caching. So this is what it looks like. Um, this right here 
is you know high level decision uh, the tree kind of sort of what traffic router has to go through um, in terms of logic. But really the key thing is right here. So this represents the whole DNS library, and you can see how we while we do localize, you know, so we've got a different RR set from Denver, different ones in San Francisco. It doesn't really matter if, if this is Denver or this is San Francisco, you're still gonna get that object spread across those servers. And uh, there's nothing you can do about that really, at least today. Whereas an HTTP library would be spread nice across all of them, which we'll see here in a second. So again, Yes, localization is difficult because you, you're dealing most of the time with the resolvers, and so you're, it's accurate as your max mind or your internal mappings are. It's easy to open. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in, in the end. Yeah, All right, so I talked about this a little bit. Um, it's essentially the same process, and uh, we use this for um, large libraries, video on demand. Um, cloud GDR, uh, linear TV, things like that, uh, where you've got a large library or long-lived session where you're streaming a, a ton of objects. So if you tune to C CNN, you don't want that client hopping around the CDN, you want that client to stick on one cache and have all of those objects on one cache. The only way to actually achieve that without doing a bunch of backflips, I mean, there are ways to achieve this, I don't want to say only, but one of the best ways to achieve it is doing the 302 where, again, you start with a DNS answer that says talk to traffic router, then traffic router can capture your IP, consistent hash, and localize you very effectively. Um, and so the process looks basically the same. Uh, there's a little bit different here because, or it's a little bit different here because you consistent hash on path, and then we have this notion of dispersion by delivery service, so you could randomly disperse across the in best caches for that delivery service. So you could say, by default, dispersion is once. So you'll always get the same cache unless it's unhealthy. If you set it to two, you'll get 50-50 between the two that are the ideal caches. And when I say ideal, let's think back to that hash rate. If something were to get withdrawn from that hash rate, the next best cache is the one that's just next up the line in the hash rate. So those would be the two caches that would be considered the ideal caches with which you would distribute the load. So dispersion is how many nodes up there that will go to one cache? Uh, to consider, yes. It, it's how many nodes up the ring it will go uniquely and then it takes that set and shuffles it. So it's random. And I think it's important to note that the configurable value for that in the delivery service is initial dispersion, and right. that can be modified dynamically uh, by the help protocol to disperse further. So if, if, if your initial dispersion is two, mm -hmm. and those two get overloaded, you're gonna start dispersing to three or four. Yeah, yeah I get what you're saying. It, it's still set to two, but if those two are unhealthy, yeah, they get pulled out from consideration, and then the next two, and the next two, and the next two, and the next two. And that's all by the... the order and by, by unhealthy, it just could be saturated. Yes. yes. So, and then when they unsaturate, so that's, it, it works. Yeah, yeah. When, they, when they become it's healthy again, then everything goes back to... But goes back. clients that are already connected will keep hitting yeah. them. That's so the you'll start consistent hash So that's hash. why it's initial dispersion, not just absolute dispersion. Right. So basically this this requires well behaved clients that stick to the edge cache. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you don't have that. Then you're screwed. Why? <laughs> why? Because you end up you end up going back to traffic router for every so is request. It, is it just that it bombards the traffic router or are there any other drawbacks? It's or? a completely unnecessary request. You don't need to, so it's it's duplicitous basically. I mean, you can do it, but yeah, obviously you would be concerned if you had, if we at Comcast had the entire population of our set tops watching the Super Bowl and going back to the traffic router for every fragment. Right. Oh my gosh, that would be horrible. Yeah, like if, if we had like a small number of, like if we had like a small delivery service j just that had misbehaving clients on it. Ah, uh, like a like, yeah, like a misfits lane for those people, something like that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could do that, but you would still be risking your your. Need to try and control it somehow. Okay. It uh, is also. Yeah. Well, did I? Like, can't control it. No, that's the thing. And the risk, though, if you can't control it, is you're risking your infrastructure, and if you're running a multi tenant CDN, you could be risking uh, service. Uh, unless you're shutting them off to dedicated servers, you're risking other traffic potentially. Okay. Uh, interfering. 
Multi-site origin, uh, there's different options for how you do this, round robin, consistent hash, we use a mixture, it kind of depends on the service, but here I've got depicted uh, consistent hash with MSO, um, and you would use this in almost, almost the inverse case of this, where your client um, isn't able to make these failovers, or the library is just so damn big, you don't want to have multiple delivery lanes like this, and, and if you, or a cable person, you might realize this is usually like a live video case, and this is more of a VOD case. So we can't just copy, like these are these are distinct remap rules, essentially. If you look at this list here, linear dash A, linear dash B, linear dash C. You can't have VOD A, VOD B, VOD C without causing a lot of storage constraints on your upstream systems. So a consistent hash here, uh, per segment, you might be going from east to west and east to west. It just kind of depends on where consistent hash sends you. Um, but that allows you to uh, suffer some failures and recover from them at your mid-tier or whatever tier of your CDM that you're at. Um, and if you see that problem, then you can switch to the other site. And essentially, it's the same process that an edge would go through to talk upstream as well, because it's just parent selection. Yeah, and the, the, I guess the important thing there is that in an MSO configuration like that, your two origins or your multiple origins have to have 
precisely identical content because you could be interleaving fragments from from each origin potentially into a single stream. Um, so if your origins aren't identical, you can't use MSO. Right, and and yeah, and, and even like things like the mutag differences and stuff. Um, well, maybe maybe the object isn't completely different. You know, I mean, the data might be slightly different or whatever. But that ends up causing miss. You know, yeah, or the middle, or even worse if you're doing range requests. Yeah. It means that you're forcing. Fast. Yeah, I didn't talk anything about range requests in this because that's a different, whole different ball of wax. Um, all right, so I talked about DNS and how it's a big pain in the butt, and you're polluting your cache, and it's and it's awful. Um, so we've come up with a, a concept at Comcast to solve some of our problems where we're dealing with libraries or clients that we don't control. We call this a large library problem. Um, DNS served services typically have this problem, and so um, I've dubbed this the white edge. It's not really the greatest of names, but essentially the concept is to use two remap rules. John Rushford put a change into ATS that allows us to disable loop detection. So you stack two remap rules up, and you have the left-hand side, right-hand side on the first remap rule. The left-hand side is the, the CDN entry point name, or the edge cache name. The right-hand side is actually the left-hand side of the second remap rule. Now, the, right, the, the first remap rule, the parent list, is like, for example, the entire edge cache which includes this host. And if you were to make that request and you didn't have that second remap, it would just loop and loop and loop and loop and loop. But because you can disable the loop detection on the first remap rule, when it hits, it, it remaps to the right-hand side, then it, even if it hits itself in the parent selection from the first remap, once it hits that second remap, it's gonna remap again, and then that's got your next tier up or your origin or whatever, and you're out. So essentially you use the front remap as a buffer, as a temporary sacrificial cache, to then hit the correct cache that actually has that object. So that prevents like the entire VOD library from being smeared across the entire cache group at the expense of a little bit of buffer cache. And you can also be more sophisticated with that by employing things like cache promote um, on the front remap to control how much that actually gets written to by popular. No, no, there's no load balancing. It's just DNS. Yeah. Yes, the cache does it. Think of it as a termination. Well, it just goes to its parent. It, its parent may be itself. It may be some other edge. And now, if, if some other edge, let's say, let's say, segment 01 on this cache, the, the parent for that is myself. If cache 04 over there gets a request for the same exact object, he goes through parent selection. His parent list is the same. He sends that request over to me. So consistent action is always the same on mm -hmm. everything, so based you, on. You essentially think of the first remap rule as way back in the day, TLS <laughs> termination and load balancers. And then you would map back to the web server behind it. It's kind of like that, except you're using consistent hashing to determine when you send that request. So it's consistent and you get cache efficiency. But again, you have to sacrifice your uh, storage or RAM or whatever you're using on that buffer on that first remap. So the and you're also sacrificing some network as well because every single miss generates network traffic into the box. So you also disable caching for the first remap rule? Depends. Do what you want to do. You do. It's it's reverse. You go here. Uh, so if, if you're asking for HBO, this guy let's this is a suboptimal cache. The dashes are the suboptimal cache. So he sends his request here, and uh, and then it's a reverse proxy back within the same cache group to the by consistent hash to the correct host. Then he has to determine if it's a catch miss or not you know, streaming accordingly. But as you will note, there's only one arrow for each request uh, requested object. There's only one arrow that actually goes out of the edge and up to the mid. 
And that's really the key thing there. Otherwise, you would have every one of those guys making requests upstream and every one of those guys storing those blocks locally. All right, I got five minutes, so I got to kind of. Well, one quick note on that that solves some of the any cap problems we were talking about yesterday, where you can get brought to the incorrect cache. And it's one of the you know, kind of endemic problems of, of any cap. This solves a lot of those problems. So the two coupled is actually pretty yeah. powerful. Well, how close together are those machines on the edge? Are they in the same tunnel or are they geographically distributed? Depends. <laughs> you tell me how your number is set <laughs> <laughs> uh, Those would be, for us, they would we use the, the park plugin, which we keep trying to open source and never succeeded at. Um, and so they're all effectively in, in the same colo. So the distance between them is sub millisecond. Right. Um, so we need to talk at the summit. Are you going to the summit? Uh, is yes summit? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Yes, you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but even if they're not in the same pot, as long as your network is fast enough and you have enough throughput, so it's, all about, it's, can do it? it's all about network distance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. This is this is a this specifically said regional edge cache group. So this would be a very localized region. This would so not be like the United yeah, States. Yes, they're close together. Yes, yes, yes. The network side. All right. All right. I gotta I gotta keep going here. All right, so what we've learned, DNS sucks um, and localization <laughs> sucks. Like, so that's what this whole prior slide with White Edge was, is to solve for the fact that we have a whole population of clients that we're never going to be able to control. We can control our Comcast clients, but we can't control all the clients. And if we want to have the largest population of clients coming through our CDN, then we have to have good solutions for that. Part of that is going to be enhancing the DNS zero client subnet extension so that we can use this on a free delivery service basis because there are some cases when you need it and some cases when you do not. And if you turn it on to everything for a big CDN like us, you are going to make your DNS people crazy. And they have to specifically configure it on their end and pick how they want to aggregate all of the IP ranges. And if, like us, you have a big CDN, that can be very, very intensive on the resolver infrastructure. So that's why it needs to be more granular. And then again, we need to gain experience with cache control. And I know within the ETS community, there's a varying kind of uh, level of experience with cache control. Some people use it a lot, some people don't use it at all. Um, we ourselves need to gain some discipline and experience there, so we're going to be doing that. And geolocation accuracy is not good, especially <laughs> with IPv6. I mean, IPv4 is all right, but v6 is huge. I have empathy towards companies like Maxmine because it's a big problem to solve. Cache remote looks like this, a little uh, sequence diagram. Um, essentially, you don't actually write that object to cache until you're down in about this area, um, and until you, you reach that threshold of popularity, it's cache miss, cache miss, cache miss. Oh, we request it in time, it's time to write it to this. So that's what that is. How do you clean well, out all of these? Yeah. So, <laughs> ah, I forgot to delete a slide. <laughs> All right, so the health protocol um, sometimes is too reactive. It's a little unsophisticated. We've seen the bell ringing thing happen, like Jamie was saying, where you can have huge swings with cache groups and stuff. It's really scary. Dispersion is to kind of disagree a little bit. I mean, it is dynamic in that it, uh, dispersion mm -hmm. takes in the notion of health. It doesn't actually adjust. It doesn't increase. So we need to be able to be more sophisticated there and dynamically adjust that. So you're saying if it's at four, it'll always be Correct. I mean, if those, any of those four become unhealthy, you'll get a fit, but it's still a set of four. So the way you right. scale as demand scale. Right. Basically, if you if you had some dynamicism in there, you could preemptively increase dispersion if you could predict that Game of Thrones was going to be very popular for you. Uh, service isolation. This is a big, big, big deal. Pay attention to Evan's talk. We've had <laughs> major, 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 major breakthroughs on that front, and these were problems that we had to overcome. And uh, sophistication around client steering grows with experience, and, and we have um, a lot of service architects that find creative ways to read caching as a consequence. Uh, so what that means is uh, we are you know, CDN engineers, and I'm an architect on the CDN team. I have to go work with other people inside my company that deal with origins and infrastructure that run through the CDN, and they've got their own ideas for how they want to deal with failover and things like that. And as they gain experience, they come up with crazy ideas, and then we're like, crap, how do we solve that one? And it's this kind of like a constant tug of war, um, but I guess we continue to get more and more and more granular. And so examples of that are kind of pattern-based consistent hash, where a traffic router needed to be able to exclude part of a path when performing the traffic consistent hash for the 302. Consistent hash with query parameters. We had something that was very 
varying on a query parameter, and we weren't redirecting properly based off of that. Force diversity in plant steering, right now the only diversity we can get is force through dispersion. Um, we fixed that in master, um, so if you want to, you can ensure that that set has no duplicate caches, so if this cache is down, the next one you go to isn't the same cache. And cache key and uh, query parameter handling in traffic control and force, because it's currently one drop down, we need to break that apart. Uh, and then more flexibility within the cache hierarchy. Uh, we basically are going to have to do flexible cache groups because of the things that um, we're seeing at Comcast. We have a need to be able to logically move and group our servers in a much more logical way rather than it being rigid. So we're going to be working on that hopefully here soon. Um, so I would expect to see some stuff on the list about that. Uh, so yeah, we need to complete the parole migration of flexible cache groups. Um, there's a, another similar dis, uh, um, diversity problem with parent selection upstream, which is something that I'll be working with John Rushford on to fix. Um, distributed traffic monitor uh, with the more granular health protocol, which incorporates uh, much more uh, detail when looking at the host than just load average and NIC throughput. Um, the large library DNS architecture, we've got the ATS side, we just need the ATC side, and that's all I got. Any questions? Jamie, you went first. Okay. Is the uh, the hashing algorithm that's used for the wide edge the same as Traffic Rider would use for a 302? Oh, you just asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so mathematically, when we run something through a hash function, um, when it goes, when it comes to the consistent hash function, you have to generate replicas. Currently in Traffic Router, we do it differently than, than um, Traffic Server, and Traffic Server does it correctly. Um, what I mean by this is you'll take a string, which is essentially just a big number, I guess, and uh, you run through and create replicas for each one of those strings. In ATS, they prepend the number like and increment it for each one. So it starts at one, you apply it to one at the front, then you iterate, then it's two, iterate, three, and that's all at the front of that string. Traffic Router puts it on the back end. And so if you actually like computed the output of what that looked like, it would be fairly close aligned because the first part of the number, large part of the number is not ever changing. So when you prepend, you're basically doing millions of additions that basically creates a big wide spread between nodes on your hash rate. When you don't do it that way, you end up with less distribution. It's not necessarily bad, but it can lead to problems. So at some point we need to fix that, and when we do that, that's gonna invalidate and AMC will feel some uh, <laughs> some kind of like a small victory after the, the what was it the cash change around three two three or something? Yeah. <laughs> there was a time in ATS when we basically invalidated the entire invalidated the entire cash for that trade, but we got through it. That was good. So we'll have to do that again with traffic routers. So well, I will say yeah, yeah. that's it. We, we yeah. got to take a lot more. All right. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. I do appreciate that emergency debugging your CDN during Apache time. I remember doing that with John. <laughs> We've come a long way since then. We have a real team that's back at home paying attention to everything while we're out here having fun. So that's all I got. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, we can talk after. Sorry, I, I, I wish I would have been tighter on time, but I didn't have my first interview, so I had no idea how I was doing time-wise.